Hey, what is up everybody? This is K-Rail reporting live from Park City, Utah in my living room. And it is, actually it's a little past high noon. It's about 12.04 my time, Mountain Standard Time. And I am on day number seven of my plant-based, vegan, animal-free diet. I'm super stoked about it. And I've got one more meal planned later this afternoon. And after that, two-day fast, baby. 48 hours. Every single month I do a 48-hour fast. And I am anxiously awaiting my next one. And I am more than anxious to find out what's going to happen with my body and how I react to it. Physically, mentally, emotionally, and everything in between. In past months and years, I would just basically follow a flexitarian diet, which is my jam usually, but I decided to go seven days in a row with having no animal products whatsoever and then go into my monthly 48 hour fast and I've never done that before. Last month I did a vegan diet a day before the fast, but I had some animal protein a couple days preceding that. So I'm curious to know what happens starting tomorrow and the next day after that. We will see, I will absolutely give you um, all the intel on what happens and I'll keep you informed. Now, I got my good friend Mark Testa that I'm gonna patch in in a minute, but before I get there, I need to give you an exercise tip because you deserve it, that's why. Now you can go to the grocery store or you can go to your convenience mart down the road or 7-Eleven or whatever it is, waltz in there, proud as a peacock with a big smile on your face and your shoulders in a good posture and you can buy a gallon jug of water for probably 79 cents. Well, maybe not at a convenience mart. They probably price gouge and jack the heck out of the money, but any grocery store you can get a gallon jug of water. I wouldn't necessarily recommend drinking that water because it probably comes from a sewer somewhere and they try to re repurpose it or something or refabricate it and make it sound like it's clean and good for you. Um, but it's not about the water that I'm getting at. A water jug weighs eight pounds and there's a mag magical, marvelous things you can do with a water jug at home if you can't afford a gym membership or if you just plain don't wanna go to a gym, etc. Or if you're traveling, which I'm gonna be doing a lot of in the next couple of months, you can bring water jugs with you and use them for workout tools. So, that being the case, for, without any further ado, I'm gonna jump back here, move my chair out of the way, and show you a couple drills you can do with water jugs. Here we go. I'm back. Here's my water jug, eight pounds. Now, what we can do with this jug is we can come into a half kneeling position like this, hold it down at our side, and we can chop up to the side like this, keeping your eyes aligned with your jug. So if you just simply do this, you're doing a little bit of rotational motion, of your hips, getting a nice core recruitment going on, and, and you're crossing the midline of your body. Cross lateral patterns affect the brain. They fire up neurons. So if you're sitting in your chair working on an article or something, or you're at your desk at work working on something, you can bring one of these water jugs, hide it under your desk in the middle of the afternoon, grab it, come down to the ground like this, do about 10 to 15 of these each side, and then you just work your core, you got a little bit of rotation in, you cross the midline of your body, you fired up your neurons in your brain, and you became smarter, and you just made your boss more money. So you should demand a raise. How about that? Great. Okay, that's one thing you can do. You can hold on to this jug. How about this trick? You can get one of these things that they invented years ago called the towel. And you can weave it through the handle of your jug. And now what you, go, what you can do is you can let, rest this over your back like this, like a papoose. And now you can do weighted squats. Look at that. Eight pounds on my back. Air squats are good enough. But if you want to add a little load, you can throw a water jug on your back and you can get a longer towel and you can weave one jug, two jug, three jugs, maybe even four, and then all of a sudden, four jugs on your back times eight equals what? Louder? 32 pounds, correct. Now all of a sudden you got 32 pounds of load on your back and you're doing a good quality squat. And these towels feel comfortable on the shoulders. It's not a barbell that's hacking into the back of your cervical spine. So, there's a couple tips you can do, and the exercise are really endless with these things. You can do chops, you can do swings, you can do bicep curls, you can do all kinds of things with a mere water jug, which costs a dollar less. You can't beat that with a stick. And everybody's got towels, unless you're really dirty, but hopefully you do have towels. So if you're at home, there's your exercise tip. If you're traveling, there's your exercise tip. Get some of these babies. Okay. All right, we need to take a big, deep breath. Everybody breathe with me, ready? I have a tendency to get excited, so I need to take some breath and clear the air, so I just did. Now, let me get Mark on here, and then we're gonna get down to business. Hey, Marley, how's it going? Long time no see. Add. That is the Buffering zone. Let me get a sip of kombucha. Mmm. Gotta put my earbuds in because I don't want you guys to keep your feet from going to the rings. Hang on, I'm getting my earbuds in, Mark. Always practice safe technology. Don't forget that. Or and you will get wet worry. if you're working out with a jug. <laughs> if you don't have the top anchor down well, 
You know, that cross body hey. thing is so powerful and amazing. I, and I love it that you brought it up and you got smarter and stuff. Because when I was in chiropractic school in the late 80s, um, right, I learned that back then. It was called cross crawl. Hey, Elisa. Yeah. And yeah, cross crawl. I would do it before I studied. I did it religiously before every test. I was the guy in the bathroom. Right. Because it wasn't what it is today, like sneaking it, you know, and I would just like really yeah. exaggerate my body motion like that. And um, uh -huh. and I swear it helped me with my testing. Well, it's it's a marvelous, magical thing that everybody no one really talks about. I mean, there's a handful. Literally, I can count on one hand the amount of fitness people that that talk about it or do it regularly or express it or educate people on it. But I'm I'm huge into cross body patterns and cross lateral. And all that stuff you see me doing with the Indian clubs and like the gatas and the maces, it's all cross body patterns. So something as simple like Mark was just doing, if you really just want to reset the brain in like 30 seconds, just stand up and then tap, lift your opposite leg and tap your knee with your opposite hand back and forth for like 30 seconds and sit back down. And then instantly your brain will get snapped right back into yeah. reality again. Right. It's pretty, it's pretty right. incredible. So Mark, how are you doing today? What are you up to? Are you in town or are you at some conference? No, I'm in town this week. It's spring break here. I'm trying not to work, oh. but it's hard not to. But uh, uh, my, my daughter's in a camp, so I'm seeing patients this afternoon. But we had a blast yesterday playing in the park. Her and I climbed trees. Um, wow. And the lost art of climbing it, trees. It is, right? It's, it <laughs> right? really is. I felt like a kid up there. You got to be, uh, you know, kids are fearless. She's Dude. six. She's like, <laughs> yeah. We, when we were younger, it would be like, we would call our friends on a, yes, a rotary phone and say, hey, what do you want to do today? Come on down. Let's climb the tree out front. Okay. So we'd go down to my friend's house. We would climb as high as he could possibly see. We'd be specks of dust up there. And then our parents would just like walk around <laughs> underneath us, not even know where we are. Then finally they'd spot us and they'd come out and look up and they'd start screaming and yelling at us. And, they, and it wasn't screaming and yelling at us to get out of the tree. They'd be saying, where have you guys been? I've been looking for you all day. And they'd say, you got to be down for dinner in 20 minutes. And then they'd disappear. Yeah. Never was it an issue of concern that we were going to fall out of a tree or like get <laughs> jacked up or like not make it out of there. Never. No. It's... And now it's like we, we just figured it out. No one ever really told us, hey, there's this thing called climbing a tree. Go out there and figure out, how, you know, this is how you do it. We just figured things out. Right. Just figured. I asked that. her. She's six. I'm like, Where'd you, when did you start climbing trees? What? How? You know, she's like, uh, Dad, <laughs> it's climbing trees. We learned this stuff. It's kids. That's funny. It's being a kid. It is. You just figure, you figure it out. So I, um, I was saying earlier that I'm just finishing my seven day in a row plant-based vegan diet today, and I'm going to begin a 48 hour fast this evening. That's great. You're more than welcome. To, you're more than welcome to join me, Mark, if you want to try another 48 hour. I fast. do, Unless but you're gonna do I, a, I can't do it. I can't do it when I'm in charge with my daughter. It's just not, Oh, you know, okay. yeah. uh, some, you know, we don't always not eat in front of her. Um, she already knows I fast a lot. We give her Christmas presents and prolon boxes. But <laughs> it's better. If, <laughs> That's good. Parenting it's right better there. if I have my wife here and we sort of shuffle not eating. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But but it's coming. It's I got a prolon kit waiting. I'm going to do it in a couple weeks. I know it's not a 48 hour fast, but I want to talk to you about some new stuff I learned about fasting. One of them is kind of what you're doing, right. which is awesome. And I can't wait to hear more about it. Sweet. Now. I need to get something off my chest, which I got this off my chest on Sunday on Instagram Live, but I want to talk to you about it, and I want to know what you know about this ingredient called leg hemoglobin. There is a burger out there. I was going to go down to the Cheesecake Factory the other day because I was jonesing for this thing called the Impossible Burger. Have you heard Yeah, of I have. All right. Now, I've been throwing this question out to some, some vegan and plant-based people that I know, and I'm getting mixed reviews on it, but some people I know who are diehard vegan and, and plant-based Love this Impossible Burger. And I have to admit, I had the Impossible Burger back in November, about four year, months ago, not years, months ago. And it was absolutely fabulous. It was probably one of the best tasting alternative burgers I've ever had. It, was, it just tasted like meat to me. It tasted just like meat, but it was like more tender and softer. And the composition of it is very identical to an actual burger that you would get if it was made from, from an animal. Now, I did some research and I went on their website and I found out they use a genetically modifying process on the yeast extract they use to create this soy leg hemoglobin. And I don't like the word genetically modified. I don't like the word Monsanto. And I don't like the word glyphosate or Roundup or anything like that. And automatically when I hear genetically modifying, my eyebrow goes in the air and a red flag comes up. So I decided to pass on going down to Cheesecake Factory to get a Impossible Burger the other day. So that being said, they also do animal testing. 
And people are in an uproar about that from some posts I was reading saying that, oh, how can they even be like legitimately a vegan company if they use animal testing and blah, blah, blah. And they, they on their website, they were trying to use all this wording about why they have to do it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense to me because I know of plenty of vegan companies out there that say right in the front, no animal testing. So why do they have to have an exemption and no one else does? So I decided no more Impossible Burger for me, not when I'm doing flexitarian or vegan or anything like that because of those two red flags. So I want to know what your take is on this this process. So allegedly they have to ferment the yeast extract with soy or something, and it creates this this soy um, leg hemoglobin, it's called, and it, it, it's the consistency and texture of regular meat, and that's where the heme comes from, the heme iron. And allegedly it has the same amount of heme iron that, as a regular burger does. So that's the whole process. So this is a bit of a catch-22 if we look at it from a, an, an untrained perspective. So you have the nutritional benefits with the heme iron, and you're getting all the nutrients of this follow-up burger on the right that's going to have the same nutritional benefits as the meat burger over here. But then you've got the ethical issues, and then you have the questionable genetically modification. So what is your take on this, and where would you stand on something like this? I'm curious. I've looked at that impossible burger, and you know what? If you want some friggin' meat, eat some meat. Because that thing is Agreed. that thing is highly Agreed. processed. It's very refined. Yeah. You might as well. Yes. So this is another thing, leg hemoglobin. It's a yeah, it's a fermentation process of legumes. Um so that right, because it's blood. That, 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 right, basically, yeah. Right. In animal yeah. pro, that's why it tastes so good. You know why they do animal yeah. testing is they gotta taste the animals and see if their burger tastes like a real hamburger. No, I'm making that up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds like crazy enough to be it case, does but, doesn't it hey, but i I, yeah. I haven't tried it i looked it up um had some conversations uh in this not on our forum but in some other forums about it's just too processed and and i'm not a vegan and i'm not a vegetarian and i still drink coffee and i will always drink wine and i will always eat meat i'm not an extremist uh, in any direction so um mm -hmm. I can't necessarily say I get behind it because of things like this. You know, there's ways to do it, mm -hmm. obviously, genetically modifying or fermenting or uh, but but if you look at some of those other ingredients, they're really highly refined. And, you know, the one takeaway and I don't think this is any big surprise that came out of that uh, low carb conference, not the one takeaway, but a takeaway is the more refined stuff is the worse it is for us. So, you know mm -hmm. what, just because it's vegan and highly refined. You know, those are like opposite ends of the, the spectrum. Spectrum. That's yeah. my two cents. I'm going to have a burger. <laughs> well, I, upon further investigation, it appears to me that what they tried to do was create a burger alternative for those people that do like meat. They want to maybe, I don't know what, watch their trans, like, uh, saturated fat intake or something. Maybe. So they can still have like, the joy of having a burger but, but feeling less guilty about it or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. What? It's, it's oddball to me. Well, and you know yeah. what? That's another important thing you just bring. Why in the hell do we have to be so guilty, so hard on ourselves about... Dude, I wrote the book on guilt. How do you think I got down to 145 pounds several years look, ago? It was all look, based me on too. Guilt. I'm the worst. I'm the, I'm, yeah, right. Exactly. We all do. I, I'm bringing it up because it's a question I ask myself. Is like being hard on ourselves doesn't necessarily make us better in, in, you know, know, in all ways, especially, and I see it so much and, and you, you've lived it in the way we eat and the way we diet and the way we, that we just like beat ourselves up. Oh, I ate like six strawberries today. I'm going to have to eat five. It's too much <laughs> glucose. I'm going to get fat. I'm getting fatty liver. Guilt. Yeah. That was my whole deal. The whole deal was by guilt. It was based on guilt, but I would be more concerned if I eat six strawberries of getting how much glyphosate that I just ate, my well, system would be the question. If they weren't, if they weren't yeah. organic, I'd be concerned. Today. Exactly. Very concerned. Yeah, I'm with you on that. But one. I want to talk about something similar, which would be hangry. Let's talk about hangry. I've, I've had, I made an announcement this morning in my six-pack challenge class to my students that I'm, I'm finishing my, my seven-day vegan challenge today, and then I'm going to a 48-hour fast tonight, and I want to see how I do afterward. And they're like, oh, I'd be hangry after two hours, and after three hours, I'm like – you don't know the half of it. I'm like, three hours, two hours? I'm like, that's nothing. I go, your, your appetite will be gone in 16 hours. You'll be feeling fine in 20. And by 24 hours, your energy is going to start going up. You're going to sleep like a rock, and you're going to feel like Iron Man or Iron Woman the next day. And you're going to just want to get it. You wanna, you're going to want to do it again and again and again. 
once you get past the hurdle, it's big time. But we, we on our reverse middle age program, we have a whole module that we talk about hangry. But let's talk a little bit more about hangry. I say to people, I mean, I think it's our motto, both of us, that you have to become, you should become hungry more often yeah, as a person. Right. Would, would you care to expand on that a little bit to put it into the kind of grade two mentality, like, like layman's terms for everybody to understand a little bit better? Yeah. Um, you know, we eat too damn much. We eat too often. <laughs> And so yeah. uh, I think in, in Sash and Panda, the circadian researcher at Salk Institute, he said 90% of people eat more than 12 hours a day. So it's everywhere. Oh, yeah. It's around Jesus. us. You know, it's convenient. We don't eat for because we're hungry. We eat because we're angry, anxious, pissed, bored, whatever. And so we just consume and we do it unconsciously but you know the awareness comes when you are fasting to all of that and that hunger is transient it's like our thoughts it's like meditating yes that's a good way yeah of it, it is it is like our thoughts it, it is and it's going to come and you can watch it go or you can fixate on it you can talk yourself into thinking you're dying but it's <laughs> I think we should consider hangry like <laughs> that's a big spirit. meditation for the uh, for the stomach. It's so it's you know we should you know because we've eaten six small meals we snack all the time. We're, we're never hungry. We don't even know what it feels like, and it, it's it's uncomfortable. And it's partially uncomfortable because one, it's a new experience because we don't experience much. But two, we're addicted addicted to sugar and carbohydrates. And the second our blood glucose levels drop, uh, our brain doesn't know what to do but start looking for more to feed it. It's like a Coke addiction or a Pepsi. That's I guess. a very good point. That's <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're being figurative or literal there with the Coke. It was like the this Coke or like the drink. It's both. Both are <laughs> both are addicting. But ironically, the probably the drinkable Coke is more addicting than this the, the powder, I would think. I mean the studies are all saying that. Um, but you've got a good point there. And the whole hangry thing is like uh, I don't know, it's just like a hidden emotion that gets triggered. And to stabilize this hangry feeling that we have. We, I mean, just taking a couple of big deep breaths. You're right. It's, like, it's very meditative. The power of deep breaths is, is, I can't state it enough. Like right before you're about to react on a situation, if it's a bad one especially, or right before you're going to blow your top or lose your temper, you should just stop dead and force yourself. This takes discipline. Yeah. Force yourself to take like a really huge deep breath, even two or three of them, two really huge deep breaths. And you'll do a little bit of, detoxing of your system instantly and those motions and feelings that you're feeling will, su will be suppressed i mean that's a basic trick of the trade when it comes to meditation and stuff and hangry is the same thing if you're really hungry just sit in a quiet place and take like three really big big deep breaths and just just wait for a couple minutes and i guarantee in like five minutes or less your hunger is going to be completely right. gone like this morning i was pretty hungry at one stage when i was training people and i got home and then i started working on a project and my hunger was gone and i'm like i'm you know, I'm so ready for my 48 hour fast. It's not even funny. The same thing will happen tomorrow. I'll get hungry when my body's expecting to eat because ghrelin will be aggravated and it'll be kind of talking. And then after a couple of minutes, ghrelin will just start coming down and my appetite will go back to normal again and I'll be good to go. And then the energy starts going up. It's just that you have to be able to want to make that transition and go beyond the, the comfort zone to get there. And it only takes us one time and you'll feel it. And when you start feeling the, the benefits of it and the effects, you're just going to be dialed right in and it's going to feel fantastic. And you're going to want to keep coming back for more. That's a great point. You, you've got to want to get past it. And, you know, I, I've started a whole new meditation practice in the last since January uh, on mindfulness, which is really interesting. And you can always come back to the breath. You can always come mm -hmm. back to your hearing, whatever the sense is. You can always focus on that. And when you do, the thought goes away. I think the same thing mm -hmm. can happen with our hunger. I was listening to some popular bloggers yesterday talking about this topic. <laughs> and, um, you know, they had a million, <laughs> they had a million and one, you know, different things. Do this, do that, try this, jump up and down, left, you know, run in circles, you know, not like that, but I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all that. It, it's just another band aid, And it's, it's uh, again, not us being in control of our own thoughts or, because that's what's making it, you know, we get, the ghrelin is doing it, but how we interpret that, like, oh, I'm so hungry, I can't even make it, or I'm going to die. Yeah, <laughs> I would die if I went two hours not eating, and no one's going to die. I mean, I, I was probably the closest to dying back in 2008, 
when I was like 2% body fat and 145 pounds. And I didn't think there was a stitch of a problem going on. And everyone out there listening, I mean, if you've got a mere five pounds of body fat, you can survive for 10 days easily fasting. And you know, dry fasting, let's talk about that. Mark and I don't condone doing it for more than 24 hours. That's when you have no food, no water, no nothing. And usually you don't bathe and you don't brush your teeth and you don't put deodorant on or perfume or anything. You just basically, nothing at all, no eating, no drinking. I highly suggest if you ever try a dry fast to be completely immobile at home and don't push the gamut at all. But I actually talked to a, I was looking at, I was researching this up online last week, how long you can go without water, without hydration and survive. So the theory is you can make it six to 10 days before you die. So if you're doing a dry fast, you technically can make it that far, but I promise you it is not easy. And it is not safe if you've never done fasting before. <laughs> and it's not even smart. You can get all the benefits you need just by doing regular time-restricted eating and also, you know, longer fasts like I do, 48 hours once a month, etc. Yeah, I'm not, I, so I, I've never that, done it. So um, it just yeah. doesn't sound. I don't aspire to do it anytime soon. I'm just too active, you know, because I want to exercise every day. Yeah. It's my gig. It's my jam. Yeah. I would, I'd rather do like a five-day fast. And just drink a ton of water and still exercise every day than, than do a dry fast for like two days and not be allowed to exercise. Because right. I've, got, I've got a streak going. I've got a reputation to uphold. It'll be 12 years in October where I haven't missed a single day of exercise. That's awesome. You know what, though? There's, there's some, you know, we need water for so many reactions mm -hmm. in our body that, you know, fasting by itself is a strain on the detox pathways, especially... Mm -hmm. You know, when you start going more than 48 hours with just water, because there are B vitamins and C vitamins that are necessary in zinc and magnesium and phase one detoxification, which takes fat soluble toxins and makes them water soluble. Then there are uh, amino acids uh, that turn into gl glutathione, methionine and, and different sulfur molecules that are necessary for phase two detoxification. And so... You know, if you're losing a lot of fat and you're right where most toxins are stored in the fat and you're starting to burden the detox pathways of the liver for too long without nutritional supplements to support those enzyme systems, you know, a lot of those toxins are just going to recirculate and resettle and maybe just, you know, mm -hmm. go somewhere else like your brain. Um, and then, yeah. you know, adding water fasting where you can't excrete those. So once the body makes them water soluble and you can't pee them out, to me, it just doesn't make sense. Now, if you're doing this, you know, once a year, one day a year for a religious reason or something, you know, I get that. But I, I wouldn't condone it. You know, it's like hearing these popular bloggers talking about all this crazy stuff they do to hack their body that 90 percent of Americans aren't going to do, can't do, don't have access to. And the value of Correct. them yapping about that instead of saying, let's teach you how to eat a well-balanced diet is, is right. dumb to and me. Let's, yeah, and it's a bit of an elitist approach in my opinion I agree. for them to say all those things because you're right. It's like not everyone out there watching right now can, they'll tune out if I tell them you've got to fast 48 hours uh, um, once every month one time every month for 48 hours and you have to eat between like 12 and six every day in between and have to do two 24 hour fasts a week and you have to do this, this, this and have exogenous ketones and blah, blah, blah. It's just like glazed over. Exactly. Out, see you later. Right. I'm off. They shut me off. Right. Where's the Doritos? <laughs> now, if I sit here and say, <laughs> exactly. Where's the Doritos? I'll, I'll, I'll never do that. But if you tell somebody you can gain a ton of benefits by eating in between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. and having three meals a day, which is basic, people will be like, oh, really? I can get all these benefits. All I got to do is stop eating at seven. Yes, pretty much. That's what we're saying. Yeah. There's a continuum. So it's, it's really that simple. Now, I have to bring something up. We were talking about food labels last week, and we just we kind of brushed on it earlier with the Impossible Burger. I have to show you my bag of hip peas. These are on sale at Whole Foods. They're really delicious, and they're vegan, too. They're made from chickpea flour. Mm. Or is it just chickpeas? Chickpea flour. And the point I want to make is this bag is it's a little bigger than my hand. I've got a pretty doggone big hand. For all of you emotional eaters out there, I want to bring something up. We talked about last week reading your ingredient labels and being very strict about it and looking for the smoke and mirrors. Now, as you can see, we got all these fancy what are they? headings gluten right here. We got gluten-free, gluten-free, kosher, vegan, non-GMO, no nuts, no soy. So a guy like me, I look at the quality of the food. Okay, it's bagged. Yes, I know it's bagged. 
It's better than Doritos. So I'm going to grab it, and it's on sale, and it's organic. Okay, good. That's a good, good snack, a good munch for me to add to my salads or something. I'll sprinkle up and chop yeah. them up. Now, here's the problem. Not everybody in the world has ironclad discipline. And if you're one of those emotional eaters, or if you're one of those people who don't have the ironclad discipline, who report back to me and say, I can't have salt and vinegar chips in my house, because if I open it, I'll eat the whole bag while I'm sitting and you know, watching Netflix. Guilty. You're one of those oh, people? salt and vinegar, dude. I don't even bring, we don't bring it into the house. It just doesn't happen. Oh boy. You're that bad, huh? Still. Well, I'm just using that. I'm just using that as a You didn't have to call me out. The sweet... <laughs> That's good. I guess I was meant to call yeah. you out. But I'm just using that as an example. But if I was to have a breakdown and eat this whole entire bag, or you were out there and you're about to eat a whole entire bag, or any of you watching were about to eat a whole entire bag of something, I highly suggest you go to your nutrition facts panel and you look at the serving size and the amount of servings per, per container. So I look at this and it says 130 calories. So you can blindly think you can eat this whole bag and get 130 calories worth of food. However, being that there are four servings in here, that equals 520 wow. calories. Wow, four servings. So if you have, and it's the size of my hand and it's, it's all air, it's like these puffs. I can eat this whole bag in a matter of seconds. I can demolish this. And I can demolish it and get to 520 calories, and I can eat a whole entire meal in addition to this bag, and not even think twice. So I want you all to take personal care of the ingredient labels and make sure that you create awareness in your life, and you read your labels, and make sure that you portion out what you're going to eat, and make sure that you know that if you eat this whole bag. So when you get a bag of anything, make sure to look at the serving size and the amount of servings per container and the calories per serving. And find out how many calories are in that whole entire package or box or bag of stuff that you get. Those, um, those circular almond crisp things, um, Diamond makes them. Yeah, like yeah. The nut crackers. Not, yeah. You know, they're made of almonds. Oh, yeah. They're like circular yep. crackers, gluten-free and all the fancy bells and whistles. You, I know people that eat like a whole box of those and don't even think twice. I'm like, you just had like 860 calories. You realize that, right? And the bag is light and fluffy. And it's like, it's like intravenous carbs to the system. It's like complete sugar. You might as well just take like... 10 teaspoons of sugar right into your system. Well, I was going to ask you, so, how many carbs are in all, in all four servings of that? What's the total in that bag? That would be 17 times 4 is 28. 68. 68 grams of carbs. In a, in a snack. So, when, you're, when, when low liberal, a yep. when a, a low, yeah. liberal low carb diet is 100 grams, you just got three-fourths of them in a snack. And then we wonder why <laughs> and a lot of people would treat this as a snack. Exactly. Right. And pe people would treat this as a snack. Right. And it's not that big. Yeah. I mean, it's like, and like I said, it's light and you don't think you're getting much there. And the same thing applies to any kind of crisp thing that has like air and puffiness to it. They're calorie bonds. You got to be very careful not to overeat those things. But know the sabotage you do if you do go down that road and eat a whole bag of something. And, and what I'm getting at, the point is, if you do the math first and you realize that that whole bag of salt and vinegar chips has 1,020 calories, you may go like Kevin did on uh, Home Alone back in 1989. And you may not eat that whole bag. It may stop you from eating a whole bag if you do your math. And I don't care if you have to get out your phone with your calculator on it. Do it. Technology is great these days. Find out how many calories are in the entire bag of, of said product before you go even opening that bag. And, and if you want to get precise with the amount of calories you're looking for, then part, portion it out. Now, being that we, Mark and I, are fasters, we don't really pay attention too much to calories, but we also don't make errors like that, too where we eat like a whole bag of something. Well, he has an addiction to salt and vinegar chips. Can't have them in the house. But he knows his problem. And, and to me, it would be cereal. Like when I was growing up, every single day, I'd have four bowls of Frosted Flakes with 2% milk in it for breakfast. And I would march on out the door, smiling my face off, saying, wow, I am so healthy. Frosted Flakes, I have two grams of fat for the whole box. And 2% milk has like this much fat, and I'm doing good, and I got protein, and I'm good to go. And then an hour later, I'd be falling asleep behind the wheel on my way to work. And I'd be like, why am I so tired? I just had four bowls of Frosted Flakes. I'm eating healthy. And it was at a point where the night before I eat those Frosted Flakes, I sometimes had a hard time going to sleep because I was so excited about eating my Frosted Flakes in the morning. So here, that's, that just goes. Yeah, here, here's, a, so, here's a tangent to that, but how we get hooked. I just read, an, hey, Troy. I just read a, a thing today that uh, American Heart Association sells their, um, their logo for as little as $2,500 and what? yes, American Heart Association, it's and they sold it to Kellogg's. Kellogg's put it and put that shit on their box of cereal. You gotta be kidding and me! It's madness. It, it's madness. It's gotta stop. And I was like, really? And so they, so you think wow. that their promotion of low cholesterol, uh, um, low fat, low sodium, like low sodium 
isn't it's not that's not killing people sodium is not there's a lot of other things that are mostly these kinds of carbohydrates that you're talking about that sneak into the diet and next thing you know you've eaten uh you know 1600 calories of carbohydrates throughout the day and wonder why you have the belly and the fatty liver and the pre-diabetes <sighs> And the libido, right? I just did a whole talk on erectile dysfunction. And if you think it doesn't all revolve around that abdominal fat, then you are putting your You're head in the mistaken. sand. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, cereal made me think of that American Heart Association thing, selling their friggin' logo to Kellogg's wow. for, the, for cheap. We could buy it. Man, the crookery is ridiculous. The crookery. They'll stop at no extremes. It's like, what, what is sacred anymore? Have we lost all of our morals and scruples? And I, I hate saying that because my dad used to say it when I was younger. And I'm like, I'd roll my eyes. He's like, no one has any scruples anymore. No one has any morals. I'm like, oh, boy. And he would, like, badger me about different things. I was in, like, grade school, and I was, I was a rebellious little punk. But now I look back at it, and I sound just like my dad. And I don't care. It's true. Where's the morals and scruples gone? It is true. Out the window, that's it's where. true. And it's, it's, I'm involved in these different healthcare forums. And, you know, they're talking about cost and quality and insurance and who pays and chronic disease. And then this comes up and I'm like, no one's going to fix healthcare. No one. We all know what the problem mm -hmm. is. No one can fix it. Troy, thank you. You're right, brother. Hashtag be your own doctor. <laughs> that, <laughs> right. Just learn, <laughs> you, you know, that, but, which yeah. brings me to if we could talk about this awareness, right? Awareness yeah. and being Let's your own doctor. Because again, all these damn bloggers who are giving more advice to the public than doctors are um, really upset me because they make it sound elitist. They make it sound like it's so simple. They make it sound like you're a loser if you can't do it. Um, and they make it sound like you need high tech. I need a, a ring. I need a watch. I got a measure. I can't do it without. What's my 23 and me say? No. How about <laughs> listening to this thing, this thing made by whoever you want to say, this body, this body is giving us messages. It is aware if we just listen to it. When I eat a bag of those things, I get a gut ache. Oh, maybe I shouldn't eat a bag of them. Um, when I take, you think? Yeah, when I do X, I get Y. Well, no one ever told me. Like, I, I saw my buddy Greenberg. I won't use his first name. And this was 25 years ago. I like the name Greenberg. This is 25 like years ago. It's like Goldberg. It is. And he's like, uh, Goldberg. He was my patient. He's like, I just got the Greenberg stomach. And I'm like, what's the Greenberg stomach? <laughs> he's like, oh, I just get. I eat a lot of green. No, he drank a lot of soda with his meals. I was like, whoa, there's your problem. Stop drinking the soda. Well, I hadn't seen him in 25 years. I just saw him 25 years ago. We talked about that. Hasn't had a gut ache since. And, but that awareness, his body was telling him, and he wasn't listening to it. You don't need 23andMe. You don't need to measure everything. I know I do, but I don't need to. I know when I slept like shit. I know when I didn't exercise enough. I don't, you know, I'm pretty aware. I know yeah. when I ate too many uh, salt and vinegar chips. Hershey Kisses. Hershey Kisses. Oh, salt and chips. But yeah, <laughs> but it comes back to listening to our own body awareness. That is the being your own doctor sort of, you know, foundation and is important to, you know, listen to your body. Of course, you know, I mean, you don't even need to know about nutrition. If you eat a cheeseburger and it makes you feel like crap, maybe you should try a salad. Maybe the salad yeah, makes right? me feel better. You don't need advanced education. You don't need to read a million books or listen to all the bloggers give you advice. That was slow motion. <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, you had technical difficulties? <laughs> that looked pretty good, didn't it? Yeah, it did. It looked kind of it's like you're doing some kind of weird, I don't know, uh, yoga pose or something. I just feel like it's got to come back to super simple to be really healthy. And that comes down to what we have been talking about a long time is move more and eat less. Not just eat less, but fast. Yeah, let's, let's just call it like it is, fast. And, you know, just to play devil's advocate here, there's also healthy foods out there that some people shouldn't be eating. Mushrooms, eggs. Um, whole wheat bread, 100% organic whole wheat bread, sprouted bread. All these foods are technically healthy. I mean, sprouted bread's more healthy than Wonder Bread. Omega-3 organic eggs are better than like Murphy's eggs that you'll buy at the local comedian mart down the road or something along those lines. However, I know plenty of people that can't have 
said eggs. They can't have, some people can't have spinach. Some people can't have asparagus. Some people can't have mushrooms. Some can't have sweet potatoes. Some can't have yams because their body doesn't have the enzymes to break those things down. And they go in, they don't go into anaphylactic shock. That's very bad, but they'll get like gas, bloating, pain in the stomach, um, fatigue. They'll fall asleep. They'll start sneezing. Issues start to happen. So obviously get rid of all the garbage that we talked about, but also be aware of how your body reacts to everyday foods that are otherwise healthy that you cannot break down. And some of my friends got analyzed after years of troubles with, with stomach aches and stuff like that to find out that they can't break down eggs or they can't have something healthy and they're heartbroken about it. And I would be too if I had, you know, if someone told me I couldn't eat Brussels sprouts anymore, I couldn't have cauliflower or broccoli, I'd be like, what? I'd be like walking around my head down all day long in a super depressed mood. But it, it always comes down to creating awareness and seeing what works best for you and your body. And that is what leads to eternal happiness. Now, if you incorporate that in with a time-restricted eating window, you're going to be able to reset your system and your hormones and you get everything back into balance and you can just have a chance of having like this massive epiphany. And you can skip on down the hall as gaily as can be <laughs> and happy. And that's what we want you to do. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Oh, uh, that's funny. And you know, I was talking to Mark earlier today. I want to, I want to shift gears for a second and talk about Easter is coming up in a, in a few weeks. I don't know if it's a month away or something like that. And I want to talk a little bit about the family traditions that go on when it comes to feasting and feeding. Now, holidays anymore for me are, you know, it's like my parents are both deceased. My brother lives on the East Coast. I'm basically a gun, a, you know, a free spirit gunslinger all by myself nowadays. But back in the old days, when I was growing up, we would have a rectangular table that was so far you could barely even see the other side. And it was filled with food, traditional, traditional Italian gig and on easter it was this big huge thing of lasagna it was brujols it was um ham and it was all these different italian dishes that my full-blooded italian grandparents would make it was amazing it was delicious food and i would eat so much i could barely move afterward and then i go outside and i'd play for a little while and i'd be starving an hour later the key element here is nowadays with time restricted feeding and fasting being so popular i would suggest all of you spend the morning not eating at all and waiting for that big feast. And even I would even take it one step further and start a 24-hour fast the day before. If you're going to overdo yourself like that and pay, pay the damages afterward, at least do a pre-fab thing where the damages that are going to be done are going to be way less than if they would beforehand if you start eating early in the morning and start drinking your alcoholic beverages before your meal appears and all these other things. Try to hold off on all that and try to, try to stretch and fast before your, your, next, your next feast comes. And Mark, you're, you grew up in an Italian background too, yeah right? same both parents first generation italians so you had the whole shebang probably just like I you just know mentioned. exactly like you mentioned uh lasagna and or homemade bread and yeah. Stuff. Uh -oh, yeah the easter breads holy cow those were delicious yes. um my mom made an amazing um raisin bread we used to have easter morning which was yeah fantastic. raisin bread did you ever have sausage yeah. pie yes oh it's so, so good. good they called it easter pie yeah yeah it was amazing yes so but i agree with that you. literally <laughs> right you pick up a piece of that and it's like, it's like density. You know what I mean? It was like thick. And you could eat like a couple of those as a kid. Cause it was like, oh. you know, yeah, it was no big deal. <laughs> but yeah, um, uh, I agree with you. And I've been recommending and doing that 24 hour fast prior to a, a big old holiday feast like that as well. You know, you go into it with lowered glucose and insulin levels. Um, and you know, so when it comes up, it's not like, hasn't been elevated for, You there? Okay. Let's go. You freeze? Yeah, my oh, phone, phone rang. Phone rang. Oh, okay. So I agree with you. Yeah. You know, that, that and, and all the damn candy. That's the thing I hate with my daughter is just mm. everybody likes giving kids candy. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> Don't do that to my kid. Give her, some, give her some keto chips. Give her some nuts and seeds. <laughs> right. Don't you know who I am? That's right. Don't do that. <laughs> um, I would also couple that with a good 30 to 40 minute high intensity interval workout first thing in the morning. I showed you guys earlier how to use your water jug. I can build your workout in two seconds with a water jug. And we do that workout fasted, and then stay fasted afterward until your big feast comes. Your metabolism is going to be revving, and you're going to get a good spike in growth hormone, and the effect of the food is not going to damage you as much as it would if you are wake up in the morning and start eating and drinking to start the day off. Now, I have a funny, you know, I'm half Lithuanian too. So I'm half Italian, half Lithuanian. In my Lithuanian side of the family, which is my dad's side, they, on Christmas Eve, 
they would make what they would call homemade bologna. Mm. And what I've later decoded it as it was called super sada, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So it's like this, this homemade sausage made with pork and also with pork casings, which is basically intestines of pigs. And my mom would grind it in this grinder and make these. And she'd make this huge bowl of it. And we would have it for breakfast. And it would be homemade bologna, some kind of yellow pie. I think it was, it was like a vanilla flavor, but it was yellow and had meringue on it. And then we'd have celery sticks and orange soda. Wow and ham wow. for breakfast and hard boiled eggs that we would color and, and me and my brother would draw on them. That's what we had for, that was a traditional Lithuanian wow. breakfast. <laughs> then four hours later, we'd go to my grandparents' house and have the traditional Italian meal that I just described before. And on Christmas Eve, especially on, um, well, it was Christmas Eve. It wasn't especially anything. They would bring out, the, all my uncles would make their own horseradish. Now horseradish is a very medicinal product. It's kind of like wasabi. And it'll clear your nostrils out in a second in your sinuses. It's a very powerful antioxidant. It's an antifungal. It's very good for the system. If you've never had horseradish, I suggest you go to your local Whole Foods and get some and give it a spin. Just don't go too heavy with it. Mark, if you have Oh, yeah. Fun, yeah, really good. Love it. Well, my dad and all my uncles would literally grow this in their gardens right. through the summer and fall. They would harvest it, and then they would pickle it and bottle it themselves. And then on Christmas Eve, they would all bring their containers of horseradish. And the tradition was we would have homemade bologna, little pieces of it. And everybody would slap horseradish on it, and that's how you eat it. In Lithuania, I guess that's how they did it. So they would have contests mm -hmm. to see of course. who made the meaner of stuff. Of course. <laughs> and like five minutes into it, everyone in the whole entire house was crying their eyes out because it was so strong. Everyone's eyes were tearing. No one could ever determine a winner. It looked like we were at a, a freaking funeral instead of a, a gathering of happiness. And it was hilarious. And uh, as a kid growing up, I was exposed to this. And I'd like to bring that back someday, but I don't know how I can – I would like to actually – grow horseradish somewhere. I don't know what the ideal climate is. It might not be conducive out here in the mountains where we're at, but that was kind of funny and whatever. It is what it is. You learn from your experiences, but horseradish is very medicinal. Just, don't, just know that and be careful of wasabi because it often has food colorings and dyes in it and it's not necessarily good for right. you. Technically it is, but theoretically not so right. much. All right. We got to wrap yeah. this thing up, Mark. What do you got cooking right now? Here's what I'm going to do. I was going to tell you about this. I want to talk to you. I'll tell you in front of everybody is I'm going to do, I'm going to post it tonight, but both in our reversing middle age group and the doc, be your own doctor group. And just online, I'm going to start, we're going to do a seven day time restricted feeding challenge starting next week. And I'm going to work with people cool. uh, in my private group, uh, the doc test of the be your own doctor group. And, 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 we're going to start out at 12, 12, and we're going to increase it a little bit each day. I'm going to, you know, we're not going to get to 16, but, you know, a little bit each day. We're going to talk about not snacking. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the benefits and how to get through hangry. So that's what's cooking right now. I mean, we're, you know, not everyone's ready to jump into a fast. We jump into the fast um, uh, by getting, you know, uh, um, fat adapted. And so this is the beginning of that. So I'm going to start that. You and I this weekend are doing uh, a fasting conference uh, remotely, which I can't wait for. Yep. I'm going to park it in front of the computer and, uh, and watch that. I've been going through uh, some of that low-carb conference because I just can't geek out enough. But, but, but the two big things this week are <laughs> uh, we're going to get the, the, the challenge launched and out there. And, then, uh, and I'm excited about this conference. So I'll see you online. For sit sure. next to and me. I will be. Uh, I'll be. Uh, I'll be sitting next to you in a different town. Right. Perfect. I won't be able to jump in until like mid to late morning on Friday because I got sessions in the morning. But whatever I don't see, I'll. I'll, I'll just watch it on the on the playback. Right. But yeah, that'll be round two of the Live It to Lead It conference. I'm psyched about yeah. that. It's always good to hear updated information, etc., on the topic that we find very desirable and interesting to mm -hmm. us. And and to any of you out there, if you're interested, um, Mark and I haven't set a date yet, but we're still going to be running another reverse middle age program. It's a 12 week program. It includes the pro one fasting kits. We will do that once every three months. And it includes a lot of excellent information that we'll be giving out every single week through a medium of one hour um, zoom calls yep. that you can either watch live or get the, re the, um, the, re the playback on. It includes my six pack challenge, my home workout, which actually involves water jug on my dad, which I did earlier. And it's, um, it's super beneficial for anybody that's looking to jumpstart your, your situation. Better hormone function, better brain function, reduce inflammation, lose weight, all those kind of things. So it's all rolled into one. Yep. Plus, we just launched our, um, our Rebuild program, which is a 12-week program through Pine Pond Superfoods and Train for Longevity. We're super stoked about that. It's a fasting and workout protocol that lasts 12 weeks long. If anybody wants that, hit it up. And in the meantime, 
Mark and I are always accessible. We're not hard to find. We don't leave the country. We don't hide from anybody. We answer questions. We're reachable. We're touchable. Come visit us in town if you ever want to do that as well. Mark will go and show you the nice parks in Denver, and I'll show you the nice parks here That's in the right. city. I love parks. Parks are awesome. Just be careful not to breathe the grass in too much if they use glyphosate, which most of them do these days. That's a whole other topic. Topic. Maybe we'll talk about that next yeah. week. Hey, Troy asked what documentary you, re, documentary you were in. You were in the Fasting Documentary by Doug Orchard. And yes, Fasting and the Motivation Factor. There were two right. of them. You should, you should do a, a double feature some Saturday when it's raining, Troy. Yeah, they're good. It's very worth it. Yes, All right, man. Always good to see you. And uh, we'll t connect uh, some more here uh, between now and this weekend, I'm sure. And uh, see you at the conference. All right, my brother. Take care, everybody. Have a great see day. Ya.